One of my favorite chants my dad used to do during the 2011 to 2014 protests in Moscow was one for all and all for one. Dictators like Putin want us to forget it. They want us to forget how strong we can be when we work together. They want us to forget how much we can accomplish when we stand side by side. Because it is that much harder for any dictator to fight an international united front than each of us individually. That is Dasha Navalnaya, daughter of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny, just four months before her father's murder, discussing the power of a united front when fighting authoritarian figures. Joining us now is world-renowned photographer Platon. He is, has a new photo essay titled The Defenders, Heroes of the Fight for Global Human Rights, a beautiful book now on sale. Throughout his career, Platon has photographed some of the world's most prominent figures as well as human rights activists and their quest for justice. Platon, it's so great to see you. My Thank goodness, you. this is really an achievement. And it's very heavy, I might add. But ten, all, 10 pounds. Is it 10 pounds? This is something else, and full of some of your, the best work over the course of your career. I um, want to talk about some of the people whose names people may not know, but let's start with some they do. And Vladimir Putin, uh, in a photograph taken in December of 2007. For you, it's not just about the image, it's the story behind it. So what should we know about this photograph? Well, uh, I photographed him in his private dasher in the middle of a forest just outside Moscow. And I'm led into the building, you know, gunpoint, snipers everywhere on a security wall outside. I remember he walks in with a giant entourage and um, I said to him, you know, Mr. President, before we make history together and capture this moment, I've got a question for you. I would like to know if you ever listened to the Beatles, because I was brought up by my parents listening to the Beatles. They translate in his ear some confusing looks amongst his entourage. <laughs> His mood drops, and in Russian, he orders the two translators and all his political advisers out of the room immediately. The bodyguards stay. And then he turns to me, and in perfect English, he says, I love the Beatles. Mm. Wow. I said, I didn't know you spoke English. He said, I speak perfect English. So I said, OK, who's your favorite Beatle? He said, Paul. I said, what's your favorite song? Is it back in the USSR? He did not like that at all. <laughs> <laughs> then he turns to me and he says, no, my favorite song is Yesterday. Think about it. Mm. And I've thought about it many years since I took that picture. And what he was doing is sending me a subliminal message about the old days of power and authority of the Soviet Union through a Paul McCartney song. Mm. And that human connection actually allowed me in. I ended up an inch and a half away from his nose. I could feel his breath on my hand as I focused the lens. And that's how I got what I believe is the truth, mm. that this is the face of power and authority in Russia. And I will say this, he's formidable, he's a strategist, and he's not to be underestimated. I believe he knows much more about us than we know about him. And he's in the midst of reassembling yesterday, attempting to anyway, putting the Soviet Union back together. I can hear people, Platon, listen to your story about Putin and saying, how does he fit into the story of the defenders? So what is the theme of this book and how does he fit? Well, the defenders is a superhero title, but uh, the people I'm celebrating in the book are not uh, powerful people. They're ordinary people who do extraordinary things. They take oppression and they take uh, trauma uh, and pain and they transform their own pain into compassion for others. And they fight for human rights and civil rights around the world. So uh, I called the book The Defenders because I wanted to honor their struggle. But whenever I had certain people in my archive that would broaden the context, I thought I should put them in. So I put in a lot of political leaders whenever I had them, if they were relevant, um, because I wanted to show what the Defenders movement is up against mm. and uh, to give uh, us a sense of you know, broader landscape that they're, they're, they're struggling against. And it, got, it cuts across from Russia to the Congo 
to uh, the Middle East with the Arab Spring and also to America. Jumping around just a little bit to show the other side of that story in Russia, Pussy Riot, if we have that uh, photograph, guys, calling up, obviously, dissidents who spoke out against mm. the man you photographed in 2007. Tell us about this image. Well, you will probably know them as the hardcore feminist punk rock group who spoke truth to power against Putin's excessive nationalism. But if you remove those colorful masks, you see something different. You see two young women uh, you see the vulnerability on their face. This is Nadia and Marsha after they were released from Siberian prison for nearly two years for standing up against authority. Now, during their trial, Nadia, the woman with dark hair, who's the co-founder of Pussy Riot, uh, she's become a friend of mine, a great lady. Um, she, the judge asked her to stand up and make her closing statement. They were kept in a cage as if they were wild animals. And Nadia nervously stood up in her cage and read out from some scrappy notes she'd made on a piece of paper. And what she said to the judge and to the world, I think goes down as one of our generation's greatest speeches. And if I may, I'd like to just say a word that she said. She said, I wouldn't give people labels. There are no winners or losers here, injured parties or accused. We just need to make contact to establish a dialogue and a joint search for truth to seek wisdom together, to be philosophers together, rather than stigmatizing and labeling people. That is one of the worst things people can do. To say that before you go to jail to your oppressors is one of the most powerful statements to call for reconciliation, call for dialogue, call for respectful debate. That is an incredible thing. And I think we need much more of that in our society today less judgmental opinions, more curiosity. Let's take a look here in the United States plot at um, the image you took of Donald Trump mm. in 2003, I believe it was, right? So, so. so more than 20 years ago, he mm. was the apprentice guy, a businessman back then, a celebrity effectively, who 13 years later would become president of the United States. Tell us about that image. Well, I said to him, you know, Donald, We've all followed your career for many, many years. No one can doubt it's an extraordinary career path you've had. But there's always something about you. There's always this air of tension and controversy about things you say and do in public. And I'm sure it's intentional on your part, but it feels to me as if you're in the middle of an emotional storm. Personally, I couldn't live with that anxiety and tension all the time. So I want to know how you weather the storm. He calmly looked at me and he said, I am the storm. Mm -hmm. I had those words ringing out through the election campaign, through his presidency, through his post-presidency, and now we're in another election campaign. And I keep thinking to myself, there's only one person who can navigate perfectly through the storm. That's the creator of the storm. Mm -hmm. Again, he's not to be underestimated. He's formidable. He's a strategist. He has his own plans. Um, don't underestimate the power of Donald Trump. And let's look at one of the defenders, finally, Evelyn Velasquez, a youth protester for immigrant rights, daughter of an immigrant being processed for deportation in the United States in Phoenix. This was in July of 2013. What a shot this is, Platt. I went to this march, and there were women and children and families marching for immigrants' rights. I saw this beautiful little girl, she was three, marching with her mum. She had a t-shirt with Free My Dad painted on it. And her, she, Evelyn's a, a citizen, her mother is a citizen, her father is not. Caught without papers, deported. This young family is now torn apart by a flawed immigration system in our country that has not been sort of updated since Ronald Reagan days. Um, the family faces extreme uncertainty now. So, but this little girl had something beautiful. So I went up to her mom and I said, can I take your little girl's picture? She said, sure. But when the little girl saw my cameras, my assistants, my lighting on the side of the street, she got spooked and she hid behind her mom's legs. That's not the picture I wanted to take of a frightened little girl. So to earn her trust, I had to play balloons with Evelyn for five hours. Mm -hmm. Eventually, she turns to me and she says, picture. Mm -hmm. 
So I took a picture and I was so inspired by her empowerment in the picture. I turned to her mother and I said, I think I've taken one of the most important pictures of my life. Much more important than any world leader I've ever photographed. Because with this picture, we humanize the data. So I said, thank you. The mother turns to her daughter and she says, the photographer's very happy. You did good. Evelyn turns around and she says, mommy, if I did so good, does that mean daddy can come home? Mm. It's time we started putting humanity back into the numbers because nothing, m numbers mean nothing without a story, a human story. And every one of these photographs has one. We've covered less than an ounce of these 10 yeah. pounds. The new book is titled The Defenders, Heroes of the Fight for Global Human Rights. Platon, thank you for being here. Thank you for your work. It's great to see you. Thank you for having me.